I, I think, you know, for me, the engine of your performance is strength. And to think about the technology behind string and to talk about which string, the tensions, the variations. Uh, Welcome back to another episode of the Abona Tennis Online Coaching Podcast, where we try to help junior tennis players and parents understand what it takes to succeed at the high performance level. Hopefully with each of these podcasts, we can bring some information to you to help you on your journey because it is not easy. There's a lot of information out there, but for parents sometimes and players, it's hard to access that information. You're very busy and so are your coaches. So hopefully with these podcasts, we can help you get one step closer to achieving the goals that you all want to achieve. This week, we have an awesome guest, friend of mine, Philippe Outshorn the head of U.S. marketing for the Technofiber Lacoste Group. Philippe is an incredible guest because he was a former professional player, collegiate player at the University of Virginia, USTA national tennis coach on the junior side of things. So his experience getting into rackets really comes from the players and coaches' perspective, so he understands things the way we want to understand things. And the more we talk about things, the more we find out rackets, equipment, and strings at least amongst the players and coaches side of things, is one of the areas where we need a lot of help. There's a We know very little, including myself, and that's why I wanted to get him on here. There's a little, a little bit of a selfish reason, but I always get asked about rackets too. So I think that this is going to be helpful for a lot of people. We talk a lot about you know how to test rackets, what's more important, strings or rackets, and all of that, and when to test it. So hopefully you enjoy this podcast, and it helps you as much as it helped me as we move along this junior tennis journey. Enjoy it. All right. Good morning, Philippe. Thank you for joining us. And thank you for coming to talk about a topic that I have to admit I know too little about for a person in my position. I think a lot of people know so little about rackets and everything. So thank you for joining us to educate us. Thank you for having me. Good morning, JY. It's a, it's a pleasure. It's always fun to sit with you. So I'm excited uh, to talk about this too. And it's been a journey for myself. So it's, uh, it's fun to, uh, to share some of that parts of my journey. Well, I appreciate you taking the time. And I think what really stood out, I mean, we've known each other for a while now, but even when just looking more at your background and stuff, you always, it's always interesting the little things you find out with people. Um, I've known that you played at UVA. Uh, right now, you're head of marketing over at Technofiber. But what really makes your position interesting to listen to is, you know, you also, you didn't just play college tennis. I mean, you played pro tennis. You were a coach at George Washington and at UCF. You coached for, you were full-time for USDA player development, working with uh, juniors there, some very good juniors. And now you're in the position where you are now. So it, your background makes it really exciting because you've been a player, you've been a coach, but now you're on the racket side of things. And so, yeah, just tell us a little bit about your experience on what you just how you got to where you are. Yeah, well, first off, it starts with me being a tennis nut. Um, I love the game of tennis I, uh, and everything that it has to offer. So, um, you know, that I, I just uh, you hear those stories many a times. But I was also that kid that was uh, hitting the tennis ball against the wall for like hours on end. Uh, had to be dragged out of the tennis club with tears. So I grew up in the Netherlands, and and uh, my school was right across from the tennis club. So I would crawl over there as soon as school was be uh, be done, and, and just spend as much time that I could to play out there. Um, and so yeah, my ambitions were always to play pro tennis. Um, I had this unbelievable opportunity to play for the University of Virginia. I took a recruiting visit. I was the luckiest kid to to even be considered. I had no idea about college tennis, and uh, had a fantastic experience there. And um, got got another really lucky opportunity, quite frankly, to do, get my master's degree at George Washington uh, and essentially get it um, paid for by coaching the team. And so I got introduced by coaching the game of tennis. And for me, it was no job at all. It was almost like a, a hobby to be able to share and kind of what I've gone through and try to help some kids Um through their times in college. And so it led from one thing to another. I went back to UVA uh, to coach for a year as a kind of the, uh, the volunteer coach there, and then eventually worked for John Roddick at, at UCF uh, before I, I, I got another unbelievable opportunity, which is to work for the USDA. So I just, I got uh, quite lucky, I think, of how I naturally got uh, these these great opportunities to work with really great coaches, uh, Brian Boland, Andres Pedroso, um, and then at the USDA, phenomenal coaches right there. Um, 
But in the meantime, I've always, the moment I, I gave up on my dreams on professional tennis, I knew I, I really kind of wanted to be on the business side of things. So, you know, I applied for jobs at Nike or Under Armour, and um, that's really where I knew I wanted to be. So at some point, uh, some some things unfolded. I got some call, uh, and it was really to get going initially on the sports marketing side um, for Technofiber. And, um, and also, you know, uh, there was a component with Lacoste as well that, uh, we were at some point going to start distributing. So once that kind of came in front of me, it rekindled that curiosity to, to, to really be on that side of the business, which originally I've, I always thought I was going to be. And so, uh, yeah, grabbed it with both hands and, and I'm here now for three and a half, almost four years and, and, and made a couple different changes and, and now, uh, leading the marketing department in the U S uh, on the Technofiber side. What? Well and now that you're in the tennis side, the business side of things, and racket side more specifically, we've talked about this in the past where it seems like, and I feel like I definitely fall in one of these categories, right? Which is you either know very little to nothing really about racket. <laughs> we think we know, but we don't. Yeah. Or you're talking to somebody who's so obsessed with it. You know, they know every little gram, every little detail, lead tape, silicone in the rackets string tensions this and that when you first started working on on this side of things i mean what are one or two things that when you learned them you were like wow did not know that yeah i'll i'll, I'll start with a funny story uh before i get get to the what I, the point that i want to make but uh so i was at uva and uh I played with a couple different rackets. Just I had no knowledge, quite frankly. Just did, did, didn't really know. Just grabbed the racket, said it felt good, or whatever you get a free sponsorship from in the juniors, and you'll just you'll happily take it. Um, but I was I was such a fan of Federer, and um, and I'm a grinder. Okay, like I'm I'm not your naturally talented dude by any means. Um, I don't hit a big ball, but I'm a grinder, and I just I he came out with this racket that was red and white or whatever, and it looked so pretty, and it was Federer as Federer is pretty, and just looks makes it look so effortless. So I was like, that's my racket, and I was fully convinced before testing it this was my racket um, because I, I didn't touch it at all, and I just grabbed that plank with like a 93 square inch and I couldn't get the freaking ball past the service line. And I wanted to make it work so bad, but it was probably the worst racket ever for me. So I ended up not choosing that, but it was, it was funny to me how badly I wanted to make something work at that time when you're playing, I was playing at a decent level, you know, you're, you're, we were fighting for national championships uh, and, uh, and doing all right. So I, I always think of that. Um, uh, so, you know, when I when I moved into this job and even as a coach, you know, equipment is an iffy thing because you don't want to get in the player's head either if you if it's not provoked or or needed or if you don't know what you're talking about. So the biggest surprise, you know, I think uh, I think the easiest is for everyone to talk about the shiny object, which is the racket. Um, it's about the weight or whatever it is. I, I think, you know, for me, the engine of your performance is strength. And to think about the technology behind string and to talk about which string, the tensions, the variations, um, and, uh, you know, the feelings, the sensations, the, uh, how tension drops and like really how much string matter. Um, and I really generally call it the engine, you know, of, of your equipment. Uh, I think that's by far number one, the biggest thing that just kind of blew up my mind and, and the technology behind that. And then surely, obviously, after that, you start realizing a lot more with, with rackets, like wing weights, foam in the hoop, uh, the grip shapes, uh, grip sizes, how it kind of affects your play. Um, so that stuff is, is all also very intriguing, but it just, it's, it's, it's not necessarily always as interesting for everyone else. I think the most misunderstood concept in the world of tennis is, is strength. It's funny you bring that up because I remember when I f was first starting to use Technofiber and I was using the, uh, the 315, uh, a little bit of a stiffer racket, right? Yeah. But, but that was good for me. But then I remember I was trying the, the black coat string and we put 16 gauge in there. And I'm like, no, with the, the stiff racket with this 16 gauge, I'm like, I don't know. And at, at this point I, in my career, at least I'd started to learn a little bit more like, hey, maybe try a different string gauge, right? And I said, hey, can I try this in 17 gauge? And uh, which I, I think is, see, I don't even know the, the, the millimeters, whatever, 1.25, I think. Yeah. I always yeah, yeah. forget. I, I have to write it down because I always forget. 17 gauge. Um, we'll stick there. It will stick there, 17 gauge. And I put 17 gauge in there. And that racket with that string at that gauge, I was like, this is it. 
That, and it just changing the gauge actually changed everything. Same strength, different gauge. And I was like, this is the combination I was working for. And that's what I was looking for. So it, it's interesting you bring that up. But, you know, to, to go back to your, you talked about like picking up the, the, the Federer racket. I did the same actually just with the pro staff. Remember they, like years ago, I, I think yeah. I was like 16, they came out with this pro staff. 93 square inch, it did the same thing. Um, yeah. How do you start to pick a racket? Is there a way to pick the right racket or test rackets? How do you figure that out? you know, for a you know, 12, 13, 14 year old kid. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's certainly, there's different stages, right? I mean, when you pick up rackets, when you're five years old, you have those shorter junior rackets and slowly but surely you, you eventually graduate to adult rackets, um, probably around the age of 10 or 11. It just depends on your level, really where you're at. Um, and at some point, you know, you start at a lower weight. Um, and so, you know, a lot of it depends on your level of performance, uh, what you can handle. Sometimes it also uh, depends on your technique. Um, but in general, let, let's assume the fact that you're pretty into tennis at this stage um, and you're playing at a pretty solid level. Um, you got to start looking a little bit more at your game of like, hey, what, what do you need today? I think, you know, the equipment is important uh, that you feel confident with it at the age of, of between at that younger age. And you have something that is uh, not hurtful. Uh, to you you don't carry a weight that is un like you can't handle just because you read somewhere that uh you know medvedev has that same weight so now i have to have that weight um so the the weight is important um and then it, it you know it needs to complement your game style also um you know if you if you struggle with power you know for us like that's where i like hey tfx would be a good racket for you to move towards um if you're a really clean striker and you need some more control and you have large swings you know, that's where maybe the TF40 can become like an interesting racket for you to start with. And so the racket should complement the game that you have. Um, and, and in addition, going back to the string, it should complement, you know, either to, to strengthen your strengths. Um, and sometimes for some, it's just to kind of make your weaknesses a little bit easier. Again, it's, it's a very personal journey, but you can start pretty broad at that age. Um, and as you get older, you get stronger you get bigger. So you need to make adjustments um, with your racket specifically. And things become, if you start earlier with that age where you're a little bit more in tune, not very, but a little bit more in tune, naturally by, by age and time, as you get better, you start becoming much more detail oriented on, on, on what you need, what you do and what you don't need for your racket. So um, going back to your original question, you know, I think you want to align yourself with, with just the general, do you need like an all court, a a power or more of a control oriented racket. Um, and then you, you pick within that family, you pick a couple of, of rackets that are appropriate within your, your eight weight range. Um, and then again, string is a, is a critically important piece. I think, uh, the number one misunderstood thing is this kids at 11 years old, having polyester and stringing it at 50 pounds. It, it's just so hurtful. It's so painful to do. And I think coaches do this as well. They just put this in, in, in people's rackets and, um, the education of like, Hey, Multifilaments is just a great way to start for some of those kids before they transition. Then you can do a hybrid. Um, and then finally gauges, you know, like you do a thinner gauge, the easier it is on the arm and then the tension to start much, much lower tension. So there are different tactics of, of there from a safety perspective before you even look at, at performance. That is, that is really important. Yeah. I think that the string part is very important because you can also let's just say you have a really good racket, you can have a really good string. If you string it at 59, right, which I think too many people, and, and I've, I've, I've seen this so many times at pro shops or tennis shops, what's the first thing they go to? Oh, just go to the midpoint of the suggested uh, string uh, tension for when you string the racket, right? Yep. Just go to the midpoint. It's like, it, it's not that simple, right? You you, if you put a polyester string and then you go to the midpoint of that recommended string tension on a pretty stiff racket, that's going to be a pretty stiff racket to play with overall. Like that's going to be tight, a lot of like too much control. You have to swing so hard. And if you're a kid, that's where you can start to get injuries too. So you, there needs to be a little bit of education on, hey, if you're using this string and you got to go polyester, you probably got to string a little looser. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, in general, um, to get a little bit more technical in it, it's, it's, uh, the harm comes from vibrations and the vibrations come from the string and the racket. 
Okay, and so there's different ways within the racket to dampen that vibrations, but polyester in general, because it's it's you know in the in the early 2000s it just changed the world of tennis um, because it used to be all multifilaments and guts, and so all of a sudden this polyester string came out and it's changed the game. I mean that's why you know the amount of spin that you can get and, and control. Obviously there are, you know there's other factors like court speed and tennis ball, but but the string itself has changed the game. And the rackets have to adapt it towards it. And so when you when you have a polyester that's by nature so stiff, obviously when it makes contact in the ball, it's going to vibrate a whole lot more than maybe something like a multifilament that absorbs that vibration quite a bit more, which is why it's so much more comfortable for people that have tennis elbow or for younger kids. Now, add a high tension to it and a thick gauge. This is the maximum vibration that you can get in across all polyesters. Some polyesters are stiffer than others. Like we carry the razor coat and the razor soft. So by nature, the razor soft is a little bit more softer, but it's still polyester. It is not to be compared with a multifilament. And so when you compare such a by nature stiff string, which is what is polyester is, and then you t do the tension as what you said, and then you say like, well, I don't really want to break string. So give me the th thickest uh, gauge. It's where you're just like, hey, you know, this is this is where you come in danger with with kids' health, and it's it's, oh, it's the biggest battle, you know, to get across this level of education because some of so much of this is preventative. You don't you don't need all of that when you're 12. You don't you know figure out how to hit a proper forehand and back and first like clean and serve, and before you start thinking about these advantages, and they might not even provide you the advantages yet at that stage that you really need anyways. So. It's it's a it's a really really important part that safety component and that health uh, component that right now uh, since since polyester has taken over and if you Google anything you can see the polyester uh, factors uh, the players that play with polyester um, that people just copy and paste and, and and mind you you know this better than me um, I think the majority of the top ten I believe but there's a quite a bit that have natural gut. Uh, still either in the crosses or mains. And so, you know, one of them is just because once you get used to that, uh, it's, it's, it's what you like and, and how you like to play. But a big part of that too is, is, is an ease. I mean, when you have that on your arm, you, again, you, you, you minimize the vib vibration. So you get a little bit more feel. Um, and so there's a reason why people do that too. Yeah. And gosh, that point you made, I hear that so much, so much, so much about, the, you know, trying to save money on strings, right? So they go to thicker gauges so it doesn't break as much. The racket and the strings that you're playing with, especially once you're already a pretty decent player, you're in high performance, right? You're playing tournaments. That's really important what you're holding in your hand. If you are trying to, I get it. We all know tennis is expensive. I mean, I'm, this isn't trying to say that, oh, it's, you know, anybody can afford this. No, we get it. I, I know, but if you are already spending that much time and money on the sport, don't try to cut it back onto something that can directly affect your child's injury and their health because yeah. you're just trying to save some money and you're actually lowering their quality of play, right? I mean, you're, you play with the wrong racket or wrong string and the wrong tension, they're going to play worse and it's not going to be as enjoyable. I think I've talked to you about that when I found that right combination with the black code and and right now i'm using the 305 i mean a tf40 was, baby the tf4 man it, it was i'm like this is what tennis should feel like so <laughs> so much goes into hey don't be careful on what you're trying to save costs on right yeah i you know just shifting uh from from uh health and safety or you know however you want to just health more so um to performance uh you know, I, I think you, you clearly see, I mean, if, if for, for those that are not aware, I mean, most players, they switch their racket with every new ball change. And the reason why they do that is because in the polyester world, if uh, tension drops immediately, it drops while you string. Like as, as soon as you finish it, if you take it off the machine, it's already dropped. And that's the, the disadvantage of polyester big time. And so if you're going to have a polyester in your racket for four weeks, I mean, a week. I mean, it's not the same. Like, you, if you were to ever want to do that, and you just grab two rackets, like string them, you know, string one racket, um, and don't touch it, and just leave it in the racket for a week, and then string a fresh one, and then play with them together at the same time. You're going to feel a difference immediately because the tension by polyester drops. So, you know, the, it 
I, I try not to get too geeky on this on the stringing. I try not to get too deep in depth, but there's there's clearly two main main components here where the education is so important, which is health uh, and not hurting yourself by picking the wrong thing, and then sheer performance. Um, and so you're right. If you're going to spend one hundred fifty dollars on that private lessons, if you're going to like travel for five thousand dollars to go to Easter Bowl for the week. It is so expensive, and I genuinely don't like this about the world of tennis in the states. And I know you're you don't love it either, but but don't don't do that on the stringing side for for fifteen bucks on a, on a set, you know, or whatever it is, or twenty dollars, whatever it might be, to save out there. Yeah, yeah, and uh, something important to when we talk about string tension, it's it's only talked about amongst the pros, but it really hasn't f- filtered down to the juniors yet. At least I not in my experience. Adrian Manorino is the, the, the craziest example of stringing loose, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. he might be in the 20s right now. Um, yeah. But there's been a huge trend over the last 10 to 15 years of pros stringing their polyester rackets. And even when they have natural gut in there, they're still, even in the 40s, right, on hardcores. But juniors don't string that way. They don't string like that. Um, and a big part of that is because these pros want easier power, okay, so that they don't have to swing as hard. But the problem is, I, I think we still have, I don't mean this as an insult, it just is what it is. We have a lot of older coaches in tennis uh, where when they grew up playing, look, when I grew up playing, I was using a head prestige uh, that I had so much lead tape on the top of the racket. And I, I can't imagine how much that racket weighed. And so it was so heavy and so much power with a stiff racket. I, I was stringing at 65 alu power. Okay. Yep. Like in that racket, I mean, it's already stiff as it is. So I was still part of that generation where just string it tighter so you can swing as hard as you can, right? But now there's been a lot more education in that you got to string looser and looser and you'll just get used to it. And it's healthier on your body and you'll still play just fine. Also because courts have gotten slow. Yeah, yeah. but I think, so I think we also need more education down at this level of juniors and junior coaching that these people have they've been out of the game of tennis right they as far as the pro level so they're not that involved in it i do think it's important hey the pros are stringing down there for a reason nobody strings very few people string 58 57 56 anymore yeah but that everybody used to be over over 58 to 65 back then yeah 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 so if if you look at like a a really brief history lesson on, on equipment uh, between rackets and strings is, uh, you know, obviously uh, not going all the way to the wooden rackets, but you know, the, 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 the racket size, the head size was smaller. Okay. First of all, um, then the strings that were used were either, let's say guts or multi-filaments, you know, um, Technofiber was the first to come out with the multi-filaments there, and it was kind of like a revolution because it was cheaper, uh, but it, it created a, like a different sensation. It was also a little bit more unfriendly, and so you get because of the way that multi-filament is built, you can string it much tighter because it's much more of a stretchable string. It's much more of an absorbent string, so the tensions back then would be higher, anyways. Then you have plenty of documentation on how much quicker the courts were. The tennis balls were a lot faster. So a lot of it was based off of control. You couldn't put spin on it. There were small racket points. It was very pure. People played serve volume. Slowly but surely, you know, obviously the racket changed when it became um, more powerful, bigger head sizes. All of a sudden, like 98 kept creeping in. All of a sudden, 100 square inches was an interesting racket to be, you know, to have. Like, And at the same time, this polyester got introduced. So, like, people got more power with the rackets. So they started stringing tighter because they got, so you know, you want to get closer towards that sweet spot. In the meantime, polyester came in. So now you have this, this, these rackets that are nowhere more 93, 92, 90 square inches. You have 100 square inches, round frame, super powerful. And you're trying to balance that with like tighter strings and a polyester. So it, it really went almost like, you know, it, it went opposite directions. And so if you if you stick with the string tensions of what you did with the multifilaments, you know, if you don't if you're not educated, you just stick with what you know that way. And today you can still string a multifilament much tighter than a polyester and be okay. Um, and there's not an issue that again, because of the technology and the way that that string absorbs it. So, you know. Bringing up to like, hey, if you're if you're more aware and was really into it in the 80s and 90s, let's say, and the equipment of, of those days and what the pros were using, 
it's just so different due to the technology, both of the rackets and how that has evolved. So it's just, it's become that that's, that's kind of the, um, the change that you see uh, and, and the lack of education that is out there. And and you see it at every level. It's, it's amazing. I mean, you, you, you say it yourself, you are an amazing tennis player. You play at the highest level. You coach the best players in the world, literally. And you're still not necessarily standing here saying like, I would like to give a lecture on equipment, which is it's just incredible. You know, uh, I just, I compare that to golf and I feel like it's, it's quite different there. Yeah. I, I guess it was a, a, a good thing. That was part of my personality. Um, but also now as a coach, you know, it's a lack of knowledge that I, I don't have that I need to find out to help more players. I, I was part of that. Dude, just give me any racket, any string, I'll figure it out. You know, if yep. I got to swing bigger, I'll swing bigger. If it's, if, it, if I'm getting the racket for free, Sure, maybe I can ask for a different string, but I'll figure it out if I need more lead tape down here, whatever. But my, I do feel like my lack of knowledge, especially towards the end of my career, when I switched rackets uh, after I was done because it didn't matter anymore, I'm like, oh, let me try this racket. I'm like, oh, man, I probably should have tested something. I'm like, that, that racket feels a little bit more like what I probably, I shouldn't have just stuck with what I just got for free. Yeah, um, it's a fine we, balance, though. It's exactly what you said. I mean, you have people who use this as an excuse and a scapegoat, and you'll you'll see them switch every six months with a racket uh, or find solutions because it's that. And then you have other people that are are clearly like putting themselves at a disadvantage, uh, which I think that was you and I a little bit more in that type of side. Yeah. So it's it, it's a fine balance because at the end of the day, you know, it, it's supposed to support you, but you're still the one swinging the rackets, making the decisions out on the court, where to go, what to do but it's supposed to support your game, uh, right? So it's, it's a fine balance. Well, I think, wh- is it fair to say that from the ages of maybe 12 to 17, something like that, you're probably going to go through the most amount of racket changes and string and string changes, more so because your game is changing so much. As you grow, you get more power. Uh, what used to be your strength maybe is your weakness because now you're taller, the grip's. So, you know, that time frame is probably the one where you might be tweaking a little bit more. And then kind of once you're 17, 18, you kind of settled in with your size. You kind of know who you are. You're, you're going to improve stuff in your game, but you're probably not changing your, your whole identity as to who you are. So is that fair to say like that, this time frame, 12 to 17, is when you're really, it's okay to maybe change every year because you're growing that much and you're learning and you're improving that much. Yeah, no, I mean, look, it's a, it, without a doubt. So I, I'm, I'm very transparent with the players, especially when I was in sports marketing uh, full time. And I still speak to parents, coaches or players. And, um, you know, if, if, if they test our rackets or if they're with our rackets today, uh, we have a couple of examples. They're so comfortable in, with the racket that they have today and they're so afraid of switching. And, I, and I'll be very honest with them and transparent. It's like you, you, you got to make a move. You got to switch. It's easier for me to say stick with the racket because I know you're sticking with us and you're sticking with, you know, there's no no fear of switching of anything. But you got to at some point you you got to make a change to the weight of your racket because you're 15 now, you grew 10 inches, you added 40 pounds, you're serving you know 120 instead of 84 miles per hour. So like you you know you're absolutely right. And then like at some point that transition from full multi-filament bed to you know, you do a hybrid and to polyesters and kind of like, okay, now you have so much more power, you need a little bit more bites and string like on that. So, you know, for us, like maybe you used to like the ice coat, but now you get the black coat because you get a little bit more bite or you use the razor coat soft so that you get a little bit more control back. So you're, you're totally right. Um, and then you go all the way on the back end that we know of the stories of players in the pro career, you know, you actually lose physicality and power and you might need instead of you always love 96 inches you might have to go to 98 or 100 uh, or you might have to you know go a little bit lower on tension so it's it's really a cycle uh, of, of kind of how you evolve as a tennis player um, and so again in the beginning the, the drastic changes are you're right at 12 to 17 then a lot of fine tuning happens and everyone goes about that process very differently post that time so Feder, big change. Remember when they made such a big deal? I think he was playing with a 93 square inch. I mean, he was number one in the world, won so many Grand Slams. And I remember after Wimbledon, he uh, started to try the 95. I remember he, I think it was a 95. I'm not sure if he finished with a 95 or 98, but even after making number one in the world, he still was like, the game had changed. Courts had slowed down. He was playing more from the baseline, not coming forward so much. He had to make a change. His identity was kind of, 
it was forced to change, right? I mean, he didn't want to change, but the game changed, so he had to change with it. Um, yeah. So I, 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 I'm going to put you a little bit on the spot on this question, and I, I don't know if there's an answer. Um, yeah. But it, it kind of puts you in a tough spot because you are on, on the marketing side of things, right? So I think back to a few years ago, there was this, there was a racket company. I'm not going to say them. Uh, it wasn't you guys. I can say that. I think it's and, a negative I'm going like this. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a negative on them. And, and it, for me, it was a pretty, it was disappointing because I think they hurt a lot of juniors with it. They tried to sell a racket and marketed it so hard to everybody, everybody. It was just get this racket, get this racket, greatest racket ever. Uh, they did a great job marketing it because you started to see kids with this racket everywhere. One day I grabbed the racket and I hit with it. And I said, I mean, this is not a high performance racket. This is not a tournament player's racket. This is a entry level, maybe started to have some full swings now kind of racket. This is not for a serious player trying to play division one, but how do you get around because they were sold so hard and, and, and you had, you know, everybody was pushing this racket. Pro shops were pushing this racket. Uh, coaches that were, you know, ambassadors of this company were pushing this racket regardless of what it was. Is there a way to kind of filter out that noise a little bit on what to choose? Or do you just say, look, I, I got to grab four or five different rackets and, you know, sure. Maybe this racket is the greatest thing ever made, but I still, I got to try a few other ones. Yeah, so I mean, first, what you're expla explaining there is is uh, just uh, great marketing in general, right? It's, it's, yeah. And it's it's less of an issue when we're talking about a t-shirt. Um, you know, it's it's less issue if you were talking maybe about hair gel or whatever it is. Like it's, but you're talking about equipment that's something so sensitive. And um, and all I can speak of is is kind of what attracts me to Technofiber. And what for me is is awesome is is for us, we're the players' company. Is what we say. So it's, it's, we listen to the players, we, we, we respond with how we build equipment based off of the players that we have. We have a very intense process and, and a tight knit, um, group of people that test our product. We listen to the marketplace and then how we put it on the marketplace, who that is exactly for. And so th that's all I can speak of, like how we handle our process. Uh, we have a, a techni lab, uh, that literally basically translates uh, sensations to, from, uh, to data. So it backs up exactly kind of like RPMs and kind of speed and et cetera, et cetera, and get you all sorts of insights to, to back up the sensations that you have. So th that, that I think every company goes about it a little bit differently. Some are a little bit more brand and marketing driven. Some of our more, maybe more closely tied towards the performance, the rackets and the people, the community that they speak towards, which I'm you know proud to say that that's what we're trying to do. You know, that's, that's really what we're focused on. You know, going back to your question, you know, if you want to have the ultimate, which is an impossible thing to ask for for your regular player, is it's just blind testing, right? You just black out every racket and just go out there and what feels good. And then eventually, you know, like that's going to be your best racket. So because you can't do that, that's where the structure is so important with some of like your coach or your parent to allow to really help and focus on that. So the kid doesn't get carried away with which player plays with it or who looks great on Instagram or the colors that look good is to like, Hey, what is this racket known for? What, what, what does it add towards? What, what does it contribute? Does it, you know, and how does it translate towards your game? And so you can go about, about it that way a lot better being like, okay, like I need a little bit more weight in the head because I need more plow through because I have a two-handed back end and I freaking nail that thing through the court. So I don't really need like a really, uh, you know, a lot of racket where there's like less plow through, where there's like weight in the handle or whatever it is. So you can find your balanced sweet spot. So immediately that racket is not what it is for me, but this racket is kind of interesting. So let me test that in addition to another, maybe one or two. Um, so yeah, you end up having two or three rackets. I don't think it's a bad thing at all to go through that uh, process. It can be with the same brand. It could be with a couple different brands, but you, you, you test that you go through that process. And, and the one thing I'll add there is when you do do your testing many a times, people grab a racket and they make the conclusion with one afternoon practice, maybe even 20 minutes. Um, and so good or bad, like you can say, Hey, this is it, or this is not it. You know, you got to be very strategic on the timing that you choose. I mean, you should have to me at least a week 
there's a reason why things happen in the off season for the pros. It's because they are away from competition and they can own in on their equipment and they can think about you know the changes that they need for their game based on the changes the, the development that they've had. And and this is another thing that is a consistent that you know I talk to Danny about and we have a specific document for it and try to coach them through it of like don't get excited when the demo comes in. And then don't just do the, the string that was in there or whatever it is. Like grab the week, start with the racket, start with your own string, your own tension, grab a couple different rackets to re- and start with the drilling. Don't go immediately into point play. And then, oh, I lost to Billy. This racket sucks. Where I beat that guy to feel amazing. Like, you know, but it's, it's true. You know, this is, this is how it goes. And so, um, sure, after two days, you, you have a better understanding of, of which racket maybe feels a little bit better. So you can start making your selection. Um, and then you, you slowly but surely you, you you put maybe the string in of the company or you you add a little bit of point play and so you can dive deeper into it so that you're fully confident with what you end up with because at the end of the day if you're you know six all in the third set you want to look down when you serve and you want to look at your frame and be like yep this is the one you don't want to think about it essentially but yeah you you brought up two things that are really stood out and reminded me of some important moments I've had with players when testing rackets one it goes back to the cost saving side of things Whenever they want to test out a, a new racket, they go grab it from the pro shop or whatever. Or they get the racket unless they got it directly from, you know, Technofiber because they're sponsored by you guys. They have the, they're using the string that's just there. Yeah. Right? That's already in the racket. Who knows how long that string has been in there. And it's <laughs> almost never the string. It, it's almost never a quality string. It's some crappy string and it's never the string they play with at the tension they play with in the first place. And I always get asked this question. It never fails. Should I put my string in this demo? Yes. yes. Oh, but they're going to charge me for it. Well, y- yeah. I mean, but they're like, oh, but I'm going to lose a string. Well, yes, you're going to string and maybe use it once or twice and maybe never again. But that's the string you play with. That's the string you're going to put in the racket. And we've already identified the string matters. And the tension you have it at matters, and it will yep. dramatically affect your feeling of the racket when you test it. You got to put in your string at the tension that you want, or learn right. Ooh, this racket, maybe I got to string a little tighter, or looser. Yeah. Right, so no, I mean it's it's an investment on that side and an investment in time. I mean, there's always a tournament to go play. Uh, you know, I mean, it's a different conversation now. My coaching side comes in from training blocks and the, and the need for doing that, but. Uh, you know, it's, it's an investment of saying like, hey, I'm going to grab these these two weeks and really focus on the first week on equipment. Um, and then I'm, I'm going to also invest in, in making sure that I get the right string. And it's uh, it sucks. But if you want to go about it the right way, it goes back to exactly what you said. If you're investing all this stuff, you're making these flights, you're driving there, you're getting this private lesson, you're doing all that. Might as well get something that you feel good about, uh, that you're going to probably commit to for the next at least 12 months. Um, so use that week. Grab that extra, you know, uh, whatever string job costs, wherever you, you do that and, and, and invest in that for five times uh, over so that you can, uh, again, you can come, you can finalize and, and have a feeling there that you feel good about it. Um, and, and again, I, you know, for a 12 year old to do this all on their own, it's impossible. So you, you need someone that can provide that structure and provide the confidence to say, hey, this is how we're going to go about it. And this is how we're going to land at exactly where we need to land. Um and uh, and then at some point when you're when you have more experience and you're 18 or 17, you can start guiding that process to yourself a little bit more because you're so much more in tune with your equipment and, and what it means uh, from strings, from tensions to gauges, to rackets, to weights, to foam in the hoop, to grip sizes, to grip shapes. Uh, you know, then you can go into very, very minute details uh, of, of changing your equipment. Yeah, and I think I think that we had talked about this before. I hope you guys are, are are actually working on it. If not, maybe this could be a great idea to have some sort of landing web page, some guidelines, because for a 12, 13-year-old inexperienced people that are just starting to play high performance that are – like some of these things we've talked about, like, hey, yeah. the polyester string tension, these rackets, this and that, because I what a lot of people do is when they want to go test a new racket – they go to the pro shop and they're like, I need a new racket. That that pro shop person doesn't know your game. They don't know yeah. anything about you. They just know what the hottest new rackets are and what this and that. So it's they need help. And a lot of times, there's another topic we've talked about offline is coaches are, are so busy just teaching private lessons over and over and over. They're not going to sit there and talk to you for like 30 minutes about like, all right, 
you should probably check out this racket with this tension and this and that. I think people also, yes, we would love more coaches to get more involved and help with this. It would be pretty cool if there was a web page on Technify where it said, hey, want to try a new racket? These are some things you should look for. Or maybe that's a blog for me to put out. Yeah. Um, so, it she sure think- is. It sure is. No, I, I think you're, you're, you know, I think that you, you can find things online. It's, it's coming back to finding something trustworthy, right? And, um, you know, A, there's a reason I'm sitting here today because I believe wholeheartedly in that and why I start the conversation on strings specifically, but also on rackets. Um, you know, you, you go back to pro shops. There are some phenomenal people out there. It's also a matter of trusting them. Uh, some yeah. stringers are really, really, really in tune and know more about it than you than you and I will ever figure out because they've been doing this for so long and they know the ins yeah. and outs of the technology. So they provide a very interesting perspective. But you know, it's 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 I'm a bit on a mission together with some other people on our team to educate um, the average consumer about string, um, and so. I'm, I'm trying to find different avenues to talk with different people about this. Um, and sure, if it helps tech and fiber string, absolutely. I mean, you know, it's still my job. It's my company. It's what I believe in. It's the product I believe in. Um, but at the end of the day, if, if uh, you know, if juniors or if, if people of age if that, that have, you know, that are a little bit older that have had issues with their arms, if, if you can prevent them through some type of medium. So I have a du- couple of different things in the pipeline to try to, Force this education down people's throat, whichever way they consume it. If it's an article, if it's online, if it's a podcast, I'm trying to burst that bubble because it's it's just, I think, almost in sports, it's the number one thing. I can't think of anything that's so undereducated and misunderstood. I really don't. I can't. I've been thinking about it. I just, I can't. Yeah, that's why we're here talking, right? I'm, I'm sitting here learning as well, and especially about the, the string part. And I keep getting reminded of stuff because you can really just go down a rabbit hole. I mean, there's so many things to talk about here, but. Yeah. You know, going back to the tennis elbow injury side of things, is it possible that a kid could also have tennis elbow or an adult have tennis elbow, right? Because of the wrong racket they're using. Not just string tension, not just polyester. Yep. Uh, we also know maybe they're not strong enough, right? You also have to have good technique, and good strength and conditioning. That, that's part of it. But if you have a racket that moves too much or is too heavy, right? Because you can also have a racket, a lot of people... If they do think it's the racket, they'll say because it's too heavy or too stiff, right? But if you also have a racket that's too light and maneuvers too much, they overspin and overuse their wrists. So you do need a balance, right? Yeah. I mean, in general, the lighter the rackets and the bigger the head size, the more vibrations kind of come kicking in. So, it, you know, it's, it's again, it's a, it's a fine balance. So I'm not going to, you know, beat a dead horse on the string. So we, we cover that side. So you go towards the rackets and, yeah, weight is really, really important to find – the sweet spot for your weight and depending on, you know, your age, your level of play, uh, that's certainly a component of it. You know, for example, uh, all of our rackets that are, uh, 300 grams and heavier for us is, uh, is, uh, there's foam induced for us with our racket. So the foam itself, uh, helps with some of that stability, uh, and countering out some of that, uh, vibrations as well. And so most pro rackets that you find on tour have foam, uh, in the hoop, but most actually general rackets that you find off the shelf do not. And so it's, it's kind of our mission uh, within Technofiber. It's always been to, to make sure that it's comfortable, uh, our equipment. And so that's one layer of it. Um, then, you know, for us, uh, in our example with the TFX, we have uh, technology basically in the dampener, uh, specifically where there's weight that also counters uh, the uh, vibrations uh, of the racket. And, it's really kind of groundbreaking technology. There's another company that does a pretty good job with this that is well known for just this. It's it just this particular part um, where, you know, it it's all about minimizing the vibration. So, you know, if it's there, there's different factors that that really go in there between like the weight of the rack, the size of the head, uh, the head wrap, the, the frame um, and then where the weight is placed. Um, but then again, you know, some of it too is just, it's just the age, the technique that they have, uh, et cetera. It's the, the frequency that they play with, uh, the tendency to get injured. Uh, so there, there's stuff of that, but without a doubt, the racket plays a role. Yeah. How helpful is it to use the dampener or a rubber band? Some players use it. Some players don't, at least in regards to, does it help tennis elbow at all? I mean, we talk, you're talking a lot about vibrations. I never thought about vibrations, but immediately I think the dampener. Right? Would would that limit some of those vibrations? Would that help you? I used to use a dampener, and then I'll I'll stop here. But I also felt like it made the string uh, tighter for me. Like I just yep. I, I felt like no, nah, it's like a dead board now. So I feel like I got to 
I have to swing out more, and that's not exactly what I want. I mean, what do you think there? I, I, it's a, it's a complete personal preference. Uh, I think it's the uh, the forever kind of like I can already see like a, a TikTok or Instagram like are you a dampener guy or a non dampener <laughs> guy? You know, like just this divide between people because some people are raved by dampeners. I love those guys that have like a the cool like uh, rubber band that they that they're own not you know like they're homemade little dampener and they're really good tennis players and they're just like yeah i don't need like one of those and then you have the ones with the smiley faces and then you have people that are disgusted with dampeners like how do you play with it you, just, you have no feel like it's just a board and yeah. so uh i think it's 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 generally it's, it's, uh, overarching it's a personal preference yeah right. okay but so there's no you haven't heard of scientific evidence that it reduces tennis elbow injuries by 13% or anything like that? <laughs> no, not that I know of. Um, I don't want to step out of my boundaries and uh, I'd have to uh, confirm with our product development team, but uh, uh, dampeners, no. Uh, not, not as far as I know, there's uh, there's nothing there. Personal preference. Okay, yeah. good to know. So, All right, so you, you dampener crazy, you can stay with it. It's just a preference. It's not uh, yeah. that much better or worse. Okay, because yeah. I get that. Like, how do you not use a dampener? I'm like, how do you play with one? So <laughs> I, I feel the same. Never have. Yeah. I, I mean, what I'm taking away from all of this is it's it's not easy. It's not simple. I would say having enough time to test rackets is probably very important because there's a couple of things you need to feel out, right? You get three, four different rackets. I would argue the way I've tried to tell the people is uh, I want you to have three weeks off of tournaments before you test rackets. I want to do it on that first week. Um, by the second week, you have to have it. I've seen people that try rackets for a month. I'm like, you're going too long and you're actually losing a feel for your game. Yeah. So I, w- I want to decide by that second week. But you also need time because I think when you, you, if you just do it randomly, my take on it is, like you said, you can't just go out there and just start playing points. And sometimes when you go play drills, like you don't have control over what you're doing, but now you're trying rackets and now you're playing your friend that you don't want to lose to and you're trying this new racket and now there's this stress and now you're losing so you hate the racket. I think you need time. So you need to either have some hitting lessons or just so go hit with a friend calmly down the middle for like an hour, feel the rackets, come back the next day, try another one under the same conditions, right? I think that's the same thing. If you try one racket simply hitting but don't hit serves, and then the next day you come back and now you got thrown into match play it's different, right? You need to do a lot of the same under the same scenarios and you need time to feel it out, but try a different tension uh, and, and probably spend that full week, week and a half to two, just testing rackets. Sure. You're, you're working on your game and fitness and everything, but you don't care like so much how well you hit. You're just trying to learn all right, what's best for me. I mean, that, that's what I'm taking from all this. Yeah, no, without a doubt. I think, uh, you know, you have to have a reason to change. Um, okay, and yeah. so that can be one of two reasons. It could be because you're, you use your racket since you're 12 and now you're 14. Um, it could be because you are, uh, top 200 in the world. Um, and you're just really, really struggling with something here. Uh, that, that, that you're looking for a potential solution. Um, because, you know, just when you're on defense on the back and side, you're just really struggling to get the depth on it. You're working everything. You feel like maybe, there's something that can give there with you with a different brand. So it, it can get that like, wide range. You have to have a reason to go through it. And then you have to allocate your time without a doubt. And then you start very broad um, under the same conditions. I would try all the different rackets because even if you start Monday and you grab one racket and then Tuesday, the other one, the next morning you feel you might play better. You might play worse. Your feelings are different too. So you start the first day and you, you basically put those rackets to the fence and you just kind of feel all of them. And you probably go through that. And then after two or three days, you get your, idea of which two probably are the ones that you feel closely related to and, and you start narrowing it down but i'm with you if you go four weeks six weeks eight weeks that's a problem uh you're putting too much time into it but you just it's very purposeful you know what you want to get out of it um you know the time that you have to feel it the structure of how you uh, do it and for some it might be the decision after five days and some it's two weeks but somewhere within that range you're, you're probably going to figure out what you need and i'm going to throw in uh just a little plug in here for Technofiber. I think this is my, my favorite job about what you guys do because this was my struggle when trying to get uh, players to test rackets, but it was my favorite part about Technofiber, which is, so if I grab a Yonex, a Head, uh, a Wilson, and then a Technofiber, right? They're four completely different rackets. 
And I'm not quite exactly sure which one is the player's racket or whatnot. I have four completely different brands. They build the rackets slightly different, completely different field. My favorite part about Technofiber was you guys have a racket for every player, uh, for every level. So I would just grab five Technofiber rackets because then it's easier to narrow it down to what, which one is the player's racket. You know, because I go to Yonix, I could grab three different Yonixes, then three different heads, then three different Wilson. I now I have 12 different rackets and I'm trying, you know, to narrow it down to one or two. So it's like, I, that's why if, if people do want to make this easier, this is not a paid for promotion or anything. Literally, <laughs> I, I think this is because this was my experience trying Technofiber. I said, hey, give me three or four of your different rackets. And I just narrowed it down. Um, yep. to what felt best for me in my game. And that, so that's why it was much easier to choose there. Because if, if you try every different brand and all their different rackets, you really can end up with 15 different rackets. It's impossible. You don't have the time for that. Yeah. Well, I, first of all, I, I really appreciate you saying that. I, uh, you know how much of a, a fan I am as you as a coach, first of all, uh, and the respect I have you for you. Um, and so for you to uh, align with some of the products that we have and feel really the same uh, and align with kind of our vision is uh, is awesome. So, there's, uh, so I, I really appreciate that. And then regarding the rackets – you know, there's a lot of credit that needs to be uh, that is due for the the product team. This was not the case uh, ten years ago. It wasn't. Uh, there's been a lot of development in product and focus on on creating this wide range. Um, obviously, by nature, it helps that you have what like twelve top hundred players or fourteen whatever with Technofiber. That you know, again, ten years ago there were two or something like that. So it's it's been a a rapid change for our company to to really create. We've always been awesome on string. We've had every string for every player you can think of. Like that's been the case for forty years. Um, but with rackets, it's it's been a strong focus to have a racket for every player out there. Um, and so. You know that's that's what we uh, decided uh, on our on our end. You know we're the players' company, and and our mission is to lo- unlock every player's potential, and and we do that because we feel that we have a racket for every player. So, uh, you know, appreciate you saying that. Yeah, well, I thank you for taking the time to uh, just help us educate more, or help us get educated more on rackets, strings, tensions, trying them out, everything. Um, we need more of this. We could probably do this for so many more times. But uh, really appreciate you taking the time. I mean, I, I don't know if you have anything to add, but just want to say thanks, man. This is great for me. Yeah, we'll take it from there. Yeah, no, on a mission, String 101, you know. So let's uh, let's start educating the country a little bit more. But uh, I appreciate you uh, letting me speak on your platform and to your community and your, your group of people. And, uh, and you're the man. I, uh, I appreciate you, JY. Well, thank you. All right, man. Thank you. All right. Have a good one. Appreciate yeah. it. Thank you all for listening to this episode. I hope you enjoyed that podcast. It was really interesting to find out how much strings matter to Philippe. And it's something that I'm going to be looking into a lot more. I used to look into the racket side of things, but I need to look a lot more into the string side of things. And it brings up a great point with just the the multi-filament, your synthetic guts, your natural guts, how much they hold tension a lot longer. Uh, Polyester, they just, you lose tension so quick. So... And the very important point he also brought up is that when you're that young in the 11, 12, 13, where we can really just really start to get some arm problems if we play too much, that at that age, it's not like the polyester is going to matter that much to you because you just don't have the power and the acceleration to really make a difference with the string you have. That really comes in a lot later. So that really stood out to me. Send me a message. Let me know what stood out to you. And if you have any more questions, uh, be happy to reach out to him and find out what he thinks. Thanks again and tune in for the next time.